Welcome back. We've been uh, looking at uh, eschatology, the study of the end times theology as far as Christians understand it. We've been looking at the, the things, first of all, that all Christians believe. So there's a, a series of things which are fundamental uh, doctrines of the church, things like the resurrection uh, and the judgment and uh, various things like that. Uh, and we've been looking at those. And then uh, most recently, we've been looking at the, the four different ideas that Christians have about eschatology and we've looked at the first three and now we're going to be looking at the final one which is known as dispensational premillennialism. Uh, this again as is classical premillennialism is, is one of those uh, where they take a literal 1000 year reign of Christ after his return and so uh, that is the the place the millennium goes but there are a few other things that dispensationalists uh, treat differently than uh, than the uh, classical uh, premillennialist. So this is the most modern view of uh, eschatology. It was introduced around about 1830. There was a guy called John uh, Darby uh, who originated a system of Bible study called dispensationalism. Um, and uh, those who believe it, that is dispensationalism, believe that's the only real true way to understand scripture and it, it, it uses that scripture 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 which says rightly dividing the word of truth and it divides uh, the bible up into seven uh, usually some have got different numbers uh, dispensations uh, and these dispensations are, uh, are God treating people differently throughout history. Uh, John Darby was a minister of the church of Ireland but he left uh, because of the corruption that he saw in all the established churches and he had many followers and he founded what's uh, the Plymouth Brethren which uh, still exist today, uh, a very small group. And dispensationalism uh, gained wide acceptance um, mostly because of the publishing of a Bible called the Schofield Bible. The Schofield Bible is pretty much the first uh, study Bible as we know it and uh, we, we, we have many study Bibles today and it basically it's notes on the scriptures as you read them. Well, Schofield was the first of those and in it, his uh, notes on eschatology were that of dispensationalism and dispensational premillennialism. So his whole understanding of scripture was, was based in, uh, in what John Darby had taught in terms of dispensational. And that certainly in the USA, dispensational became uh, the, the most widely accepted uh, form of eschatology, pretty much solely because of the Schofield Bible. Later, uh, another Bible similar uh, called Dakes came along and they, the two of them both uh, uh, promoted the idea of dispensational theology. And because they were the earliest study Bibles, they were widely bought by many and, uh, and many took on that uh, theology as a result. That doesn't say that it's right or wrong, that's just how it, uh, it was uh, proliferated. Most of the books you read about end times theology, most of the films you might have seen, are all following this dispensational idea of uh, end times theology. So dispensationalism itself is a system of theology rather than just an interpretation of end time uh, scripture. And, uh, and it's difficult to look at the two separately from each other. The unique key characteristic of dispensationalism, dispensationalism that affects eschatology takes the view that the church and the Jews are entirely different in the plan of God. Therefore, the Jews are one dispensation, one of the ways that God is testing man. And uh, the church age is a different dispensation of how God is uh, testing man and um, so this current dispensation of the church will be ended by the rapture and the church uh, will be taken out they will be caught up in the air and taken away and the dispensation of the church will then end during the millennium reign of Christ uh, the remaining promises relating to the Jews will all be fulfilled Jewish temple worship, for example, will be re-established. The land of Israel uh, to its historic borders will be restored to Israel. And uh, those types of things will be re-established during the millennium reign of Christ. So the events 
uh, according to a dispensation, let's go like this, the church age, where we are now, the rapture of it, the church. So the, the, the church is caught up to meet Christ in the air. Uh, the tribulation, so the rapture comes before the tribulation uh, for a dispensation list. The return of Jesus at the end of the tribulation. Armageddon, the, the millennium reign of Christ, a thousand year reign of Christ, which is a Jewish kingdom on earth. And then final judgment. Uh, so in a sense, there is a, there is a secret return of Christ at the beginning of the tribulation, which is known as the rapture. And Jesus comes and takes the saints away to another place and, uh, and and then the tribulation comes and then Jesus public return is at the end of the tribulation that's the major eschatological difference uh, between classical premillennialism and uh, dispensational premillennialism most uh, dispensationists believe that uh, the rapture will take place at the beginning of the seven year period of tribulation although there are those who believe that it will be mid tribulation and uh, this is known as mid tribulation rapture or pre wrath rapture and they believe that uh, Christians will be there for half of the tribulation and then just before God's wrath is poured out on the earth they will be caught away then um, but we tend to put that together with uh, uh, um, uh, dispensational premillennialism simply because it's the same order of events, it's just the timing of them slightly different. You can have a look at that, there's plenty of written about the pre rough rapture position, and you can uh, find out about that. So, uh, arguments that are used in uh, favour of a pre-tribulation rapture, uh, most of the arguments that support classical premillennialism are also used to support dispensational premillennialism. Uh, things like the thousand year reign of Christ that is described explicitly in Revelation, uh, that Satan is not bound now, and that scripture teaches two resurrections. All of those arguments are common with uh, classical premillennialism. Uh, and the difference, of course, is that uh, 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 dispensationists believe that Jesus will return uh, at the, uh, at before, after the tribulation, but the saints will be caught away before the tribulation. So, uh, one of the main problems for classical premillennialism is that the imminency of the return of Christ is uh, is sort of lost a bit because if Jesus is returning at the end of uh, seven years of tribulation, the day or hour is is not completely unknown. Um, so, in a sense, dispensationalism, uh, classical disp uh, disp dispensational premillennialism, is trying to address that problem. Um, the rapture of the church precedes any of the signs of the, that are taking place uh, during the tribulation. And so therefore Jesus could come at any time. Um, scriptures used to support this view include 1 Thessalonians 4. Although personally I find it difficult to see anything secret about that passage. It talks about Jesus coming and the saints being caught up and the trumpets and the angels and all of those things. Other references are only implied from biblical statements about the surprise element of Jesus coming. So things like that he will come like a thief, which is found in Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Or uh, um, Matthew 24, Jesus says, keep watch because you do not know uh, the day your Lord will come. And in fact, the early church expected Jesus to come at any moment. In fact, when uh, Paul wrote his second letter to the Thessalonians, to Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verse 2, he tells them, Jesus has not already come. Some of them were thinking that he had already come. And, uh, and then he gives them some more signs to, to know when Jesus will come or not. So uh, those passages um, are, are, are used to support um, uh, this, this, this uh, surprise, if you like, return of Christ. Um, the, the, the problem I have with that is that um, that then uh, you're separating this secret return of Christ and the public return of Christ. And uh, if the 
if the church is caught up, then the, the public return of Christ, which is what is all described mainly as in Scripture, is uh, is then known is seven years after uh, the rapture. So uh, although this tries to deal with the imminency of Jesus' return, it is difficult to see how it actually does deal with the imminency of Jesus' return. Uh, you probably can tell that I'm not a dispensational premillennialist, and I'm sure uh, a dispensational premillennialist will have an answer to that question, but for me it's a difficulty uh, for them. Uh, the second uh, argument used in favour is that God would not pour his wrath out on the saints of, on, on his saints. Um, dispensationalists argue that the tribulation is an outpouring of God's wrath and he will not pour his wrath out on the church. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, Revelation 3 verse 10 and 2 Peter 2 verse 5 are all uh, verses used to argue about that. 2 Peter 2 is where it talks about Noah and, uh, and Noah was saved from the flood. And, and our dispensations will say that uh, Christians will be saved from the flood. Uh, uh, and, and they describe the being caught up and taken away as the equivalent of the ark of Noah's day. They also uh, use uh, the argument that the word church is missing after the first three chapters of Revelation. So if you read Revelation, the church, word church, Greek ecclesia, is used in the first three chapters, but not thereafter. And their argument is that that the beginning of Revelation, the church is still there and afterwards it's caught away and only uh, uh, Jewish uh, believers and people who come to Christ during the tribulation are there that must mean that the church is not present during the tribulation is their argument so uh, those are the arguments used in favor uh, the arguments uh, the, the problems if you like uh, with uh, dispensational premillennialism uh, for me are this um, it's not consistent with Jesus teaching uh, Jesus teaches in Matthew 24, Mark 13 and Luke 21 that he will return after the tribulation and after the Antichrist is revealed. Uh, Jesus said the, says then the elect will be gathered from the four winds. A dispensational premillennialist would argue the saints have been caught up before this and this uh, gathering refers to the Jews during the millennium reign. However, Jesus uh, says this in the context of telling his disciples not to be deceived by people saying that he has already come, Matthew 24, verse 26 and 27. So it doesn't really appear to be Jesus uh, uh, consistent with Jesus' teaching on this. And for me, it's also not consistent with Paul's teaching about the end times. Um, uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17, the coming of the Lord will be with a loud shout and a trumpet, and then the elect will be caught up to meet him. This, this verse poses a particular problem, I think, because it, it, a dispensationist argues that the church is almost like a secret rapture of Jesus. Jesus won't be seen. It's just the church will disappear. But this says uh, uh, there's a loud shout and a trumpet and all, all of that is the same uh, language used to describe the public return of Christ in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And also, uh, Paul says, don't be deceived that the Lord has already come. The coming of the Lord will not be until the Antichrist has been revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1 to 4. Again, uh, Paul is, uh, is, is writing to the church in Thessalonica uh, uh, to tell them, don't believe it when people say he's already come. Uh, he hasn't come and he won't come until the Antichrist is revealed. And to me, that is not... Uh, consistent with the dispensational uh, uh, understanding of end times. And Paul tells the church in Thessalonica they should not expect the return of Jesus until after the Antichrist. For me, he could not be more specific. And uh, in that, he's referring to his earlier letter where he describes uh, what is now known as the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. And for me, again, I've already mentioned this, the, one of the problems with uh, dispensationalism is it doesn't really deal with the imminency problem uh, uh, that it is supposed to deal with in a way. If all the saints are gathered in a rapture, then Christ's second coming, his public second coming, will be predicted seven years later. Therefore, the people will know the day uh, of his return because it will be seven years after uh, the rapture itself. 
Some would re argue that this first return fulfills the imminency part, uh, but my question is, does it? Immediately after the description of the coming in glory, Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour. This coming in glory, what is this, the actual return of Christ, is uh, what Jesus refers to when he says no one knows the day or the hour. That's in Mark 13, verse 26 to 32. So for me, it doesn't really answer that question, that problem of uh, that is also true of uh, classical premillennial premillennialism and uh, also uh, finally uh, the final problem is that it's not normal for God to reveal his people from tribulation we know throughout history that it's not God's normal practice to take people away but to be with them during tribulation so for example where I spoke before in 2 Peter of Noah where uh, where uh, where the Jews are where, where Noah is, is uh, a dispensationist would argue that like, like Noah, we are caught away and we're protected from God's wrath as Noah was, except that Noah was not caught away, but he was protected while still here. And it was a pretty uncomfortable uh, thing to be in, a, in an ark with uh, uh, full of animals and, and food and, and dung and all of that for a year. And uh, so you, you could argue that it's not God's normal practice to catch people away, but just to protect them from God's wrath. And uh, the argument that God would not inflict tribulation upon his people means that those who suffer now, those who are being persecuted now, in a sense, they're being unfairly treated because some are suffering for Christ now. And yet those at the end would be taken away uh, during all of that. So just to conclude this uh, brief outlook at dispensational premillennialism, uh, the first glance at dispensational premillennialism would seem to be attractive. It, it retains the premillennial, the literal uh, reign of Christ, a thousand years, yet deals at first glance with the weaknesses of classical premillennialism, which is the imminency of the return of Christ. Um, however, it seems to me to raise more problems than it deals with, particularly in relation to Jesus' teaching and to Paul's teaching, which explicitly says that the saints will not be caught up until Jesus comes in glory. Attempts to answer these questions I've already mentioned have, attempt, have uh, included multiple raptures and different ideas about when the rapture will occur during the period of tribulation. And uh, there, there, there's, there's, uh, there, there are many uh, different ideas, uh, uh, and all of those are to try and deal with the weaknesses that are within uh, dispensational premillennialism. Uh, that's all f for now on that. Uh, obviously, we've now looked at all four of the main viewpoints uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the church on, on the uh, various uh, uh, ideas about uh, the end times. Uh, my suggestion now would be to go back and look at all the teaching we've done and see how we think our understanding of the final uh, state of man or the resurrections or the judgment or, or all of the things that we've looked at, how do they fit in with, which, which one do they fit best with in your understanding? As I've said before, all of these have got strengths and weaknesses and uh, uh, we have to understand that we need to be able to overcome them in our mind. And as I say when I teach this at the Bible school, I, uh, it, when, when Jesus came the first time, the Old Testament Jews expected him to come looking like a certain thing. They expected him to come as reigning king. And in fact, he came as suffering servant. And now we look back and say, oh, well, yes, that was obvious. Did they not read the prophecy? And th there's something within me that says when Jesus comes again, and we'll see what it looks like and we'll look back and we'll say, well, it was obvious, wasn't it? But we never saw it before. So it could be that none of these four are right and we are all just taking stabs in the dark. Well, next time we're going to look at uh, Revelation. We're going to look at that in two sessions. And we're going to look at Revelation and, uh, and try to understand how it all fits together, uh, which is a fairly uh, difficult to understand uh, thing. OK, see you then. Bye.